you know, before the meeting, thinking about the, the, the feeling of being the R&D guy in this room when you're surrounded by the, the commercial guys, the marketing guys, the sales guys, that's kind of the feeling that I get on a, a regular basis, being an R&D guy engaged in, in social media and healthcare. It certainly is, the, the conversation is, is certainly focused heavily in, on our commercialized products, but what I'm gonna talk about today are some op opportunities uh, as they relate to clinical research. I'm gonna follow on the, the topic from this morning, and, and that topic being around storytelling, and start with a story myself. And that story is the, the road that led me to taking an interest in this area and led me to this, uh, to this platform today. That road starts back in 2006. Um, as I mentioned, I've worked in uh, drug development uh, now for about 15, 20 years. And back in 2006, I had a, a one startup, a clinical technology company that, that did very well. I was working with another company, uh, on, with a venture-backed biotech company. They were doing great, partnered their product that led to their acquisition. So work things were going great. We had just celebrated the, the birth of our, of our second child. I'll pause here for you to, um, to ooh uh, or awe, thank you. Things in general are going well. And then, um, and then I had a cough. And that cough was more than just a, a, a regular cough. It was a cough that just wouldn't go away. It was a persistent cough that lasted uh, for really, I guess, in retrospect, several months, but uh, escalated to disrupting quality of life, disrupting sleep. And so uh, I went off for, uh, for a chest x-ray, thinking that I'm going to come away and get told it's bronchitis and at least have a plan going forward. Uh, for those of you who um, are, are at-home radiologists or do-it-yourself radiologists, the, the, on the left side is a normal chest x-ray, on the right side is what I came away with. Uh, suffice to say that the radiologist, my radiologist's interpretation of that was markedly abnormal. So go off for some, uh, some CT scans, MRIs, PETs, a couple of biopsies. The long story short, coming away with a, with a diagnosis of a disease that I'd really never heard of before, pulmonary sarcoidosis. Um, and now turning from being a, a drug developer to being a patient, I started to look at this and try and manage it the way that I knew how to manage. I was an information geek and I wanted information. Similar to Dave's story yesterday, I was self-tracking and collecting information about my progress, the impact of interventions on pulmonary function as I was uh, uh, keeping my own spreadsheets. I was passionate about collecting my health records and aggregating that and engaging in online communities as well as making sure that I understood the literature as well or better than any physician that I went to go see about what was ailing me. Um, and it was only a few years later that I came away with another diagnosis that I was actually an e-patient. So with that as the, as the road that led me here, uh, the, the question that I came away with was what happens when that highly informed and engaged e-patient comes up against a blinded and randomized clinical trial. The types of clinical trials that we conduct on a regular uh, basis within the pharmaceutical industry. And by distinction, I'm not really talking about other um, opportunities for e-patients in clinical research. We've, we've heard great stories from, from Hugo, from patients like me, from Cure Together, about patients crowdsourcing around research, around aggregating and sharing uh, their data. Um, but those create very important and valuable uh, longitudinal clinical data sets with patient-reported experiences, but they're not interventions. They're not introducing a blinded uh, intervention in a randomized way in a, in a defined population, the types of studies that we do every day. So let me talk for a minute about the, the different perceptions of the e-patient from the perspective of the clinicians and the folks that are developing these medicines every day. I think the first perception and per perhaps the most uh, frequent perception that I get uh, when I talk about this topic with colleagues in R&D is, uh, what's, what's an e-patient? Does that really exist? To them, this idea of an e-patient really is still a unicorn. These folks are still heavily invested in understanding their technologies, their platforms that they're developing against new targets. They're not really looking at the outside space like the people in this room are. 
I think another uh, perception is this feeling that this e-patient can be very detrimental to my randomized clinical trial. I'll share an anecdote, actually, around this. A couple of months ago, I was on a panel uh, hosted by the online patient community, Inspire.com, and I was on a panel with a, uh, with a cancer patient. And that patient was saying how, um, at the end of the panel, she needed to run off. She was participating in a clinical trial at the NCI and had to run off for one of her, uh, for one of her follow-up visits. And by the way, how great it was that the patients that were participating in that clinical trial at the NCI were also all engaged in this online community. And they were all talking about it and sharing their experiences and information and supporting one another. And I started to think, that's great for you, but that actually can be really disruptive to a blinded, randomized study. When cohorts of patients are sharing together about inclusion criteria, perhaps how to coach one another to meet inclusion or eligibility criteria in studies, when patients are sharing um, observations about potential adverse events, uh, when patients are sharing observations that may suggest who's on one treatment arm versus another in a blinded study, these conversations happen, especially with some of our more high-profile mo molecules in certain disease areas. We can't stop those conversations from happening. We, we need to understand that these conversations are happening, though, because they will impact how we interpret the, uh, the output. I think the, the vast majority of folks in R&D look at the patient in a friendly way, that this patient will be, uh, be a boon to recruitment. They're online, they're engaged, I can, I can reach them online and uh, help to inform them about clinical trial participation. Uh, in addition, we're, we're, we're uh, increasingly interested in uh, capturing the voice of the patient through patient-reported outcomes and studies, and that e-patient who is uh, already sharing their voice uh, hopefully would be uh, uh, very engaged to share their voice as a participant in our studies. The folks in R&D really don't have that holy grail view that some other folks in other communities may have, that the uh, e-patient will solve all the problems that we have in R&D. Um, and we have a few problems in R&D and development today. Uh, for those of you that aren't clinical trialists in the room, clinical trials today are largely unsustainable. They're expensive, they are costly, they are complex. And very often, we tend to think that there isn't a lot of room for us to innovate in clinical trials. Because of all the regulations and all of the processes, sometimes the best we can do is come up with words like operational excellence. The best we can do is just operate against our SOPs really, really well, but we don't really have a lot of room to innovate. And I think one of the, one of the opportunities that comes up here is, are there ways for us to partner with e-patients uh, to address some of those uh, challenges in clinical research today? Can we uh, partner with e-patients to increase and improve awareness about research as an opportunity and an option for patients when they're facing a new disease or a treatment option? Can we engage with uh, these communities to improve recruitment and retention in our trials? Um, what are the interfaces around those patient-reported outcomes, especially when so many communities of patients are now capturing patient-reported outcomes on their own um, at, at iGuard, at patients like me and elsewhere. What are the implications of movements like the quantified self, where patients are meticulously self-tracking over time, to our clinical trials, where often we use a lot of sensors as well, accelerometers, uh, other types of monitors in, in the context of our research. And as I'll talk about in a few moments, what are the opportunities for partnering with the e-patient in clinical research as it relates to data sharing and sharing the learnings that we capture in our studies. So I'll share um, two things that we can do today in clinical trials uh, around that engagement with e-patients. And the first is what I will call making clinical trials more patient-centric. That in the world of clinical research today, I would argue that clinical trials are investigator-centric. We go out and we uh, do feasibility studies and we try to identify investigator sites around the country, around the world, who we think can enroll uh, studies for uh, patients to our study. And then we can only enroll patients who are in geographic proximity of that site. And we have the patients travel in and out 
of that site. And all of our communications and relationships are through that site. It creates a hub and spoke approach to clinical trials and cr clinical research. And I would suggest it also increases uh, the burden on the patient and from a convenience factor, which we know from data is a significant barrier to patient participation in studies. Uh, I would say it's also uh, a factor in limiting the scalability and the, the reach of uh, clinical research and clinical trials. So from a patient-centric perspective, are there opportunities for us to shift that focus from being centered around investigators to being centered around patients, where we can leverage tools and technologies like we'll be uh, like we've seen here and we'll be talking about even later this afternoon around quantified self to enable patients to participate in randomized trials more from home, where they could be enrolled uh, from home and participate at home or, or via mobile. And would that be a vehicle to increase um, convenience and access and thereby increase uh, participation? This can be uh, enabled through telemedicine and e-health devices and tools and interoperability of data. This can be enabled through health information technology, enabling patients to share trusted data with us uh, on their own and without requiring as many, or in some cases perhaps even any, uh, physical visits to, uh, to an investigator. The second thing that I would uh, note that we can do today is to make clinical trials participatory. And the two elements to that that I'll talk about are sharing clinical data and sharing study learnings and results. When you participate in a clinical trial, we collect a lot of data from you. Uh, that can be data that's abstracted during an interview with a physician. It could be diagnostic data, labs, EKGs, images that we acquire from you. Very often, we take that data, we send it off to a lab, and then that data goes into our database. And that data, by the way, is pristine. We monitor it, we clean it, it's structured, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very good data. We're very proud of that data. We spend a lot of money on it. But we don't have a feedback loop today to give that back to the patient who participated in the study. And what would happen if we did? Would there be opportunities for the patient to use that data on their own or in the context of their relationship with their provider to increase their own or improve their own health and wellness or decrease their own costs. As an example, if you are participating in one of our studies, we collected blood from you, sent it off to our central lab and have that in our database, well now if you're going off to your treating physician, he doesn't have access to those results. He's gonna, he or she is going to end up drawing blood off of you again and you may have to pay for that inconvenience. Um, in the past, one could argue that there weren't really tools available for us to be able to readily share electronic data, your data that we have about you from your participation in our study back with you, but that's not really a valid argument anymore. And we know that uh, tools such as personal health records are freely available. If other institutions with data that I would argue is far less structured and immaculate than ours can do it, certainly we should be able to do it as well. The second element around making a clinical trial, I would say more participatory, is sharing the information and the learnings. A participant, an e-patient, any patient has shared their body with us in a clinical trial. They should get the learnings back that we get. We have some uh, work we're doing right now with a group in Boston, a nonprofit called Syscrip, around converting the summaries and the learnings of investigational products uh, into lay language and communicating that back to, uh, back to the participants. We're looking now to expand that uh, into YouTube and, and other, uh, other channels as well. I'll wrap up by saying that um, within our organization, we're looking at a number of ways to make clinical trials more participatory and patient-centric. We have a number of initiatives underway. Uh, there's at least one that I was hoping would have some data output that I would be able to share with you today, but the best I can do is uh, make that uh, something of a, uh, of a teaser and, uh, and see if, uh, if, if you like this topic. We'll be happy to come back and hopefully have some more output to be able to share. So I'll leave off there. Thank you very much.